1986. That was the year that the Challenger exploded. It was also the year of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. 1986 presented the Chicago Bears as our Super Bowl champions, and the computer system Nintendo was just in its beginnings. 1986 was also the year that Channel 6, then CPHS 12, began broadcasting. Good evening, I'm Edward Senek, and tonight we're gonna journey back to 1985, when McKinley School, which is this structure behind me, was the administration building. And there was some talk about the district getting a TV station. Well, going back uh, 20 years, and I don't, I don't remember much of what happened yesterday, much less 20 years ago, but it was a, we came out of, a, uh, in the history of the school system, a very difficult time in the early 80s. We had split sessions in high school. We had deficit uh, uh, budgets, the quality of our education, and I think the respect that the community had for the system, the school system in general, was probably at an all-time low. So bit by bit, we came out of that uh, out of those difficult times and um, it's about 86 just prior to 85 I think we were approached by Heron Cable who had uh, the uh, the rights to uh, cable television in the area they needed to invest in the community as part of their contract with Port Huron and I remember Jerry Bouchard saying you need to go talk to the Port Huron area school system we got a call that uh, from the city and uh, back then Jerry Bouchard was the city manager and the call came to the then superintendent, Larry Moeller, indicating that there was a chance that uh, through the refranchising that the city would have to go through with the cable company, that uh, there would be a possibility we might be able to pick up a local television station, either for the city or the school district or maybe the college, and would we be interested in, in looking at that? Well, we uh, indicated to the city manager that, yes, we'd like to consider that as a possibility, and I hung up and I said, yes, we're going to have and called him back and said, we've decided and we're interested, <laughs> and we would see that as a very welcome opportunity. So it didn't take us long to decide. And so uh, we decided we would pursue it further, and we were invited by then Heron Cable uh, to take a trip down to Philadelphia. Uh, Heron Cable took, I think it was 10 or 11 people from our district, staff members as well as board members, out to their corporate office and we discussed it and we discussed the possibilities of what it would mean and how we would operate it as a school district and they were very positive and very helpful and were very desirous of having a quality program. Uh, there was a setup there that we could view that was run by students in the Philadelphia area through Heron Cable. So we had a chance to view that. We also had a chance to listen to the opportunities that might become available to the school district as to what they were going to do, how long would it be for, and the guarantees that before a school district has to stimulate people to become attractive to it. The next day, as, as Heron Cable gave us a tour of different facilities and their facility, uh, the different needs came up about what we were getting into, and this is the whole reason we went down there. What, what does it take to run a television studio? And I remember the, the, the fellow from Heron Cable, I think he was a vice president or an executive VP or something of that nature, and he said, well, you know, you, could, you can take your cameras and you can go to a football game and you can broadcast your high school football games. And Larry Moeller would say, and Larry was so astute, I mean, the wheels were always turning with Larry. And Larry would say, well, we can't afford that. Uh, who, are you going to pay for that? The hair and cable guy, well, yeah, I, I guess we can do that. And so the next conversation, you go see a studio someplace. He said, well, that, that costs a lot of money, that studio, the lights and the remodeling. And he said, um, you're, you're going to throw that in, aren't you? Well, by the end of the day, Larry had this, the hair and cable totally committed to absolutely virtually everything. No cost to get into this system. And we came back basically with the semblance of what we have today. But there was a lot of work that followed that up. The things that I remember most at the beginning was, where are you going to put it? Finding the right space was very, very important. And we spent a lot of time talking to people, thinking about it, and knowing that uh, the, the cable company was going to front the original cost of, of some of this renovation. So we wanted to make sure that whatever place we chose was going to last for a long time. It was going to meet the needs. 
We were real interested in having it centrally located if possible, and that's why ultimately we chose McKinley because it's about the same distance from McKinley to Northern as McKinley to Port Huron High School, and it's centrally located to all of our other schools. So when the, when the kids come down or the teachers come down to do shows, it's uh, sort of centrally located. You know, there was some space maybe at the warehouse, which is out on Dove Road, and to get children out there, the students out there, would be additional cost. So uh, meeting along with uh, Roland Johnson and, and uh, I think it was Mr. Kimball at that time uh, to decide where possibly would be least disruptive to the school district. And we did have a little rooms, uh, some room available at the back of the McKinley School, which at one time was the old special education center, which had been moved. And so that was space that was able to be renovated. And I think the actual TV studio, the classroom for the high school kids, uh, the areas to do the editing and so on has been very satisfactory. What's really nice about television is that people get to see you sort of sense what your personality is about and you have a chance to reach a large audience. I write a letter, I reach five people or 15 people. I speak over television, I reach 1,500 maybe, even if it's a bad evening. The television entity in and of itself is just wonderful in the sense that you can reach large numbers of people, they can see you, and sometimes what they see can be nearly as important as what you say. So uh, all those Channel 6s grew up in ways that matched the personality of that community and their own interest in community television. Uh, some communities embraced it, like Port Huron, and uh, it went to the school district. Some communities, they just developed it uh, specifically as a government channel and uh, just used it for municipal government uses. Back then, this is how we did a remote, a camera here and a tape recorder here. Nowadays, it's all housed in one unit, which makes things a lot easier. And if it's a simple shot, I can get away with this. But in 1985, equipment wasn't the problem. The district officials knew that they had a TV station, they knew they had a building to put it in, and they could order any piece of equipment they wanted out of a catalog. Now they just needed someone to operate it. You know, in terms of hiring staff for CPHS 6, I knew that that would be the most important part. Obviously where it's located, the quality of the equipment, all that's important, but the people always are the most important part of any program. And at that time, what we were really looking for was somebody that could work well with the community, work well with the schools, was a good planner. One that could work well with students, somebody who could handle the students' ups and downs, who could answer their questions, who could provide them with the necessary information. And as, as always with an educational class, students can make mistakes, and that's where the learning can come in. The station had been, I started in September of 85, and they, that's when we started setting up all the, the pro, what we were going to do here, just production-wise and programming and policies and guidelines. And what existed here was an empty room. It was just four walls and that was it. When the station was established and when there was certain needs to be filled, Heron Cable was really great about supplying resources and setting up the equipment and teaching me how everything operated and then we started hiring people to work here because it was it ended up being quite a big operation with education and public relations and local production of all the schools activities and so everything was falling into place the call letters CPHS which stands for cable port here on schools was conceived by Alyssa and was one of the final steps to be completed before Channel 12 was ready to make its debut. The first day, February 27th, the ribbon cutting ceremony, which was really exciting. The state um, superintendent of education from Lansing was there. Um, Dandergro led it. Larry Moeller, uh, Bill Kimball, everyone was there that was important to the school district and also Heron Cable. It was, 
and I believe the first day that it was officially open, and we gave a tour to all those people here, and then we aired that tape that we made so everybody that watched the station could see it. It would be difficult in a few words to describe how we feel as a district. The cooperation that we've gotten from the state of Michigan, State Department of Education, from our good Senator Dan DeGroe, and from the Heron Cable Corporation. So as a result of their efforts in working together, we have the privilege of being here today. Well, first it was a long time ago, and I was much younger, much thinner, but uh, I do remember well. Uh, the school district decided they were going to put together a TV station. They had a lot of help from Heron, then Heron Cable, and we were able to get a significant state grant and the state superintendent, uh, then Phil Runkel, uh, helped me get it. We were able to pull together a large grant. We were down here for the opening that day in February of, uh, would have been 86. We have two high schools, Phil. I understand that. I <laughs> I think we better look at a grant next year for PA system. <laughs> I, knew, I knew if we turned that up, we'd get the grant. <laughs> Marsh Campbell has played a great role in putting this together. And one of the meetings we had when we flew to Philadelphia to meet with uh, the Heron people, uh, Marsh said to me, now once we get the studio, how are you going to get the additional funds to get it implemented into the buildings? And with that, I told him I'd have balloons falling from the ceiling, right? At the <laughs> uh, and at that point in time, we called our good senator, Dan DeGroo. Yeah, of course, with any ceremony, we, we, uh, this was a, a, a very big event for the Portland Schools, our own television studio. And so Larry Moeller wanted to do it right and, uh, and have a, uh, a ceremony, dedication to, the, to Heron, thank Heron Cable and all the other people that were a part of that. So we had a little ribbon cutting ceremony. And of course, Whenever you have these things, there's always something that doesn't work. The details, uh, you know, devil's in the details. And what didn't work in the ribbon cutting ceremony were the scissors. The ribbon was real, the scissors weren't. Uh, I guess they didn't trust uh, Marsh Campbell or I with real uh, sharp edges. But uh, the large fake scissors wouldn't cut the ribbon. And now I know why they asked me to be there, because I, I always carry uh, my Swiss Army knife with those little scissors. Uh, don't ask me why, but Marsh had a, a small, uh, well, I guess it was a, a knife, but it had one of those little scissors on the knife. I guess he'd be expelled if he had that in school today, right? But anyway, uh, his little knife had the scissors, and that's how we were finally able to cut the ribbon for the auspicious uh, debut of Channel 6. And the years quickly passed. And since time is intangible, we could easily measure the years through the changes of technology. We went from a bulky three-quarter inch tape, which gave us 60 minutes, to Super VHS with two hours. And then finally, DV Cam with three hour capabilities. Thus, a football game could be captured on one tape instead of four. And with the change in technology, there also came a change in our name of CPHS 12 and a change in the faces here at the station. CPHS 12 is moving closer to number one. Beginning Tuesday, August 1st, CPHS will move from channel 12 to channel six on your cable television dial. Tune to channel six, August 1st for continued- Well, actually, uh, Heron Cable, the cable franchise at the time before they became Adelphia and then Comcast after that, approached us about changing the channel location from 12 to six, and the reason was that they wanted to align all of their educational access channels on their various cable systems in the area to channel six. And I was very open to that idea. I welcomed it because we were suddenly gonna be placed on the cable uh, spectrum between channel four, the NBC affiliate out of Detroit, and channel seven, the ABC affiliate out of Detroit. And so naturally, as people were doing their channel surfing between channels two, four, and seven out of Detroit, they would stumble across channel six. So we had a lot of fun with that, and it was just a positive move for the channel. This is moving towards number one. So make the move with us. Tune to the new CPHS 6, beginning Tuesday, August 1st. What I came into was uh, a station that was established. Um, Alyssa Gagino, prior to me, the 
the founding station manager, I guess you would say, she did all of the legwork. Um, really, me coming in after her was very easy to do. She's the one who had to work with the cable company to get the television facility. She had to order all the equipment. She had to hire the TV teacher and work on the TV curriculum. And so really, I see the position that I came in was a very good one in that everything was established and I got to enjoy the station and kind of tweak it and fine tune in certain areas. When I was here as a student, Mrs. Foxley taught a lot. She knew a lot about production, drama, production on stage, but Jeff Casson, the station manager, was really the man who taught us all about the technical stuff, how to use the cameras, how to edit. Yeah, you can telling us what we could do on camera and what was possible. Well, I've always been interested in video camera work, and when I found out, the found out about the class, I naturally just signed up for it. We were very comfortable with Jeff Casson as our station manager because he's the one that, you know, he proved our shows that were going to go on Channel 6, and then he up and left for Florida. So the school district, the administration hired a new person named Sue Broadhagen. I think she was fresh out of college from Ferris State. She came here and we didn't know what she was about. She didn't know what we were about, so we were kind of leery. Is she going to let us keep airing these programs we were producing? Or is she going to say, no, that's not the kind of programming I want on Channel 6? But she really uh, leaned on us. We leaned on her and it was, it was a good relationship. I remember when I first came in the station, I, I was impressed. I thought, wow, this is a really nice facility, you know, schools, you know, you might not think they're going to have um, maybe the latest and greatest, and we certainly didn't always have the latest and greatest. Uh, you know, some things were, I always say you can take a, a good picture with a brownie camera, and so we had some, you know, tube cameras, they're known as, and they're uh, a pretty old technology, and a lot of our equipment was, it was showing its age and being around for a few years, and of course this, this uh, business, the equipment's always changing. We replaced the cameras in the studio. I believe we replaced our lighting. So yeah, there was quite an influx of equipment because I just felt like if we're going to be teaching kids, we need to be using more modern equipment to show them what it's going to be like in the real world. And Channel 6 provided real world training. Students weren't just making videos designed to entertain their own small circle of friends, but now they had to appeal to a whole television audience. Shows that required a professional quality, like City Beat, Focus On, and in 1992, a live program called Homework Hotline. I read an article in a cable TV publication about a Homework Hotline program that they were doing down in Lubbock, Texas, and I thought it would be a really neat idea for Channel 6. Um, so I called the, the Lubbock, Texas station, talked to him a little bit about it, got a tape, watched it, and then I shared that information with Sue Broadhagen, who at the time was the TV station manager. Hello and welcome to Hotline Halftime. I'm Sue Broadhagen, Channel 6 station manager and co-producer of the Heron Cable Homework Hotline. And I'm Jeff Casson, supervisor of instructional technology and the other co-producer of Heron Cable Homework Hotline. And this that was week a show we take a that was around look for several years the where uh, students could call in on Monday nights, I believe it was, and ask NHS students uh, for help with their homework questions. And that was a pretty overwhelming success. And these local kids became local celebrities. It took a crew of about 16 students to put this on each week, from the camera operators to the telephone operators to a director to the tutors to people we called runners who would run the questions in from the phones into the studio. But we had textbooks in here too. Every textbook in the district was located in this room. And so when a question came in that the tutors may have gotten stumped by or it might be in an area they weren't familiar with, uh, those of us that came every night would be resource people. And we would work diligently back here trying to find the answer to the question in a relatively short period of time to get it back on air. Homework Hotline, I think, was the first truly live show that we did from Channel 6, and so it came with its unique set of issues. Uh, when you go live, you know, anything can happen, and it did. Um, you know, if something went wrong during the show, we'd have somebody crawling on their hands and knees in front of the camera, you know, as to not be on camera, and, you know, plugging wires and whatnot, and of course, occasionally somebody's head would pop up and you'd see them on the air. Uh, we had a few bloopers along the way. Uh, you know, I remember one I was directly involved with. Uh, someone called in, and I'm not sure what I was doing at the time, but I obviously didn't get the gist of the question. But I heard 
how many children at Woodrow Wilson was what I heard. So I quickly went to my office and pulled out this, the sheets that told how many students we had in each particular building and wrote it down, ran it into the tutors and I can remember the reaction on air. Uh, the tutor looked at it and said, my, 550, they must have been very active. The question was how many children will Woodrow Wilson have, not how many were at Woodrow Wilson. I, I remember one student, a question came in and uh, the question was, who is Louis Armstrong? And one of our student tutors butted in right away and she said he was the first man to walk on the moon. When in fact they were talking about Louis Armstrong, the musician. So that certainly made our, uh, our bloopers tape, but again it was a live program and it, and it gave us a good laugh. One of the, the neatest things is we always try to keep it light as being the supervisors of these high school students. You know, you wanted to keep them keep them in a good mood and everybody, you know, keep it stress-free. So at one time, at the end of the show, we, we show credits from a camera up in uh, the top of the studio. So it was shooting down and you could see all the, the people and the lights and things like that. And we had the director tell our camera operator on one of the cameras to keep moving back or side, sideways because they were in the shot. And actually, they weren't in the shot, and we were trying to get them in the shot so we could see them over live television because it wasn't often our camera operators got to be on, on TV, so it was kind of kind of fun. And you get in a little bit of trouble, but <laughs> it's, it's all, all in, in good fun. We did our best to not have, you know, anything major happen, but again, you know, live television is, is what it is. Homework Hotline ended production in 1997. By then, Sue had already taken another job in Traverse City. Jeff was now an administrator, and he... Ken, Ken, what are you doing here? Well, I heard we're doing Homework Hotline. Well, well no, this is just a, a mock set. We're not actually doing it anymore. Oh, well, I thought I better show up. I mean, after all, I was the first guest. <laughs> well, uh... Well, Jeff had already been an administrator, and he hired me in the year 2000 to become the station manager. Excuse and then me. after that, he... I, I do have my trivia questions ready. <laughs> uh, after that, uh, uh, he shortly left, and, and he left? Jeff left after he hired me? Is that right, that he left after I... I mean, did he actually leave because of me? Was it something that I did? Jeff came to us one day and said, I got another job, I'm, I'm going to another school district. And we were like, whoa, you know, Jeff has history here. You can't do that to us. You've done it to us once when I was in high school, and now he's doing it to, to us again as an employee. And we were all pretty, pretty scared because then they, they told us who they hired for his position, and, and we didn't know the man. He was a assistant principal over at Portland High School. And we're like, what kind of television background does he have? You know, he's, he doesn't know us. He doesn't know television. He doesn't have a love for television like Jeff had a love. But he came over and after 10 minutes told us, you know, shoot for the stars and hopefully we'll get the moon. And that man moved us forward a decade within a year of him being here. Well, I got, I got involved with Channel 6 uh, when I was asked uh, to come to central office and become the director of technology. Uh, and under that scope, um, Channel 6 fell. So came out and actually uh, got, to, got to looking at the involvement and what goes on. I was quite, quite impressed with uh, all the things that uh, was being done, uh, you know, with, with the limited uh, uh, facility and limited equipment you had at that time. And when you see it on TV, let me put it, when you see it, you know, watch it on TV and stuff, you don't see the studio. You see what the studio wants you to see. And it was a, I was surprised it was a small, actually, you know, square footage left that you'd be able to accomplish all the things that you were able to uh, with the, with the uh, si physical size of it and the facilities at that time. And uh, I had the confidence of the staff. And it's kind of like I said, you know, before in the running of the whole, the whole studio, my whole philosophy was, you know, support the staff out here. Let them, they're the experts. They know what's going on and what they need. And we had a lot of conversations where, you know, I had a rule, just, just convince me that it's needed and why it's needed, you know, justify it. And then we just go from there. Channel 6 has thousands of tapes. We've been around for 20 years, and you just kind of accumulate that many programs. And 
we used to have to go into a storage closet in the school and open it up and there's boxes just stacked stacked on each other upon each other and they were numbered and we'd look through the boxes and find the right number and try to find tapes and put them on channel six. It was just pretty sad. When Mark Law came, he saw our situation and said, this, this, isn't, this isn't happening. I had an opportunity to uh, bring in uh, some shelving units that uh, you could actually store your videos, organize your videos instead of going through cardboard boxes literally, uh, you know, and taking them off shelves out of this closet and, and trying to find things and equipment. So it opened up other areas where, you know, you could get yourself uh, more organized uh, on the studio side as well as on the library side of the, of the past. Uh, productions. And because of that, we don't call it a tape library, we call it a tape library. And now let's take a look at some of these treasures that have been housed in these cases for 20 years. I don't know if anybody would remember this. Maybe Bill Kimball. <laughs> um, somehow the fire alarm went off in the building and all these sprinklers went on and of course there were sprinklers in our control room and it just was raining, you know, inches in the control room and we just, Mike Wazinski and I, just went ballistic and we were like we've got to save the equipment <laughs> you know and we have to save the tapes you know we just had to save everything so we went in there and you know there was like I don't know a, an inch of water and we were just sloshing around pulled tapes out pulled equipment out and nothing was lost and then afterwards we were like gee there was a lot of electricity probably in there and how stupid we were doing that but you know you just do what's I don't know it was stupid but but we were heroes. <laughs> One thing I remember clearly about Channel 6 
uh, was back in the Marianne Foxley days as the, as the TV teacher. And it was during the show Adventure Island, the kids show with the pirates. And we were taping an intro for the show and Marianne got this idea that we should show the pirates crossing over the Blue Water Bridge into Port Huron. Sounded like a great idea and she called the Blue Water Bridge Transportation Authority and got permission to, to videotape that scene. So I went out there with her and all of the students and we set up and it occurred to me that I hadn't seen any cars in a while. And it dawned on me that they had stopped traffic on both sides of the bridge in order for us to videotape this short segment. And I think that segment appears for about 10 seconds in the intro of the program, but the bridge was shut down for about 20 minutes. And when we went back to the other side, the lineup of cars on the American side was unbelievable. So uh, that certainly sticks out in my, my mind as something that we didn't expect was going to happen, but it's one of those stories that you tell years later. Channel 6, be, even being a small station that we are um, educational access in a school district, we have taped a lot of celebrities. Mickey Rooney came to town and we were able to go out and, and videotape him. A lot of politicians like uh, John Engler, uh, Governor Granholm. But some of the most memorable ones was Ross Perot came and he spoke at one of our graduations. I can't remember what year it was, but Ross Perot came and spoke to a graduating class on the request of some family of a student who had passed away. Um, she had campaigned heavily on his uh, behalf when he was running for president. And he came here out of honor for her. And that was uh, another, that was the first time we broadcast the graduations live from McMorrin. So that was a, a pretty big coup. The other neat story was I was gone on vacation and I came back on a Wednesday and I had three students approach me and they're like, Mrs. Sinek, we, we want to do a, a program. We want to do a little program on the Vice President, Al Gore, coming into town. I'm like, they're not going to let us take a video camera down and videotape the Vice President of the United States. It's not going to happen. And they, they're like, oh, please, please, you can, you can oh, tr please try. And I'm like, oh. I made a few phone calls and talked to the right people. And they said, we'd love to have some high, schools down, high school students down there taping. But we need some information. We had, all, we had a background checks on all of us. They sent us our press passes. We get there, and I think it's the FBI or Secret Service. All the Secret Service guys are lined up checking the, the people with press passes in, and they have dogs, and they're making us open up our camera equipment. They're patting us down. They literally made us turn on all of our equipment and take pictures and hit record so they could, could see it working because you know, they had to take all the precautions that there wasn't a bomb or it wasn't a gun. And we were up on the, these bleachers, I guess, just for press. And like the kids are, that I brought are talking to the guys from NBC and CNN. And, and they're just sharing. These, these professionals are just sharing all the information with my high school students. And it was just a really good experience for them. I saw a need to have a van for Channel 6. Channel 6 goes out into the community to tape not only athletic events and band shows or band concerts and other school activities, but also some community events. And to pack up all of the equipment that we had, um, to, to borrow a van from the district was one more step because before these productions, a few hours before the productions, we would have to go out to the transportation office out on Dove Road and borrow a van and bring it in and load up all of our equipment, we come back late at night and have to unload. Well, I saw a need for a van for Channel 6 and was able to get one of the maintenance vans that was no longer needed uh, by the maintenance department. And rather than selling it as they typically did, we were able to get that for Channel 6. And so I saw that as being, you know, an area that we needed improvement and was happy that, um, you know, I could bring that to Channel 6. I hated doing remotes. I love being at the basketball game or going to the football game and doing the remotes, but it was just a pain. We would have to take all the equipment that was in the studio and physically carry it out to a van, a blue work van, and the equipment was in a suitcase, and we'd have to lift it up and carry it out to the van, and a lot of times it, there wasn't a lot of manpower there to help us carry it out. It was just maybe myself and a couple other girls it was just very difficult on our backs and you needed a lot of strength to go on a remote or you're hoping to have a lot of kids just to help you carry all that equipment from the station to the van, from the van to the school. So, but that changed once Ed Senate came aboard. He 
first step he did was he put all the suitcase equipment that we have, the switcher, the monitors, he attached them to wheels. So we were able to now to wheel them out of the studio up to the van and he made ramps and we wheeled them up on the ramps into the van. But there is yet something missing. We were crammed, it was tight, it was cold a lot of times at those football games. And with the help of the city, Randy Fernandez, who does a program here called City Beat, he said, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Is there something you need? And he goes, you know, I really need a bus. Everything's about collaborations and partnerships these days. And, uh, you know, Channel 6 was kind enough to, uh, to do the City Beat show. Again, uh, helping out uh, not only the city government, but basically promoting uh, our downtown area and, and our city as a, as a whole. And it came to me, again, most of the credit's got to be due to Jim Wilson and his board of directors at uh, Blue Water Area Transportation Commission. And I, you know, just asked Jim one day, you know, what do you do? He's got these, uh, he's got about a fleet of 25 to 30 buses, if not more. Uh, some are natural gas, some are not. And, uh, you know, after a number of years, they kind of get recycled and he gets some, some new buses in. Uh, you know, he said, Randy, you know, tell uh, Ed and, and the school district that, you know, if one comes available and my board uh, uh, agrees with it and everything, that we'd be more than happy to help out Channel 6 and, and uh, basically donate the bus. So again, it was just, you know, uh, Channel 6 and the school district helping, uh, helping us. And again, uh, just uh, Jim and his board and my way in the city of Port Huron's way of saying thank you uh, to Channel 6 and the school district for all the fine work that you do. And I'm glad it's worked out uh, the way it has. But even with all the latest equipment, like a nonlinear system, or a lightweight camera, or a spacious bus, there is no way that Channel 6 could have produced as many programs as it has without the numerous hours of help from our students and our volunteers. Uh, it, it takes a lot of people to run Channel 6. Uh, we cover a multitude of, of events ranging from uh, an award ceremony to a graduation. Uh, but in order to do that, we have a, a very limited paid staff. Uh, basically, three, four people is all we have, and, and only really one of them is on a full-time basis. And so we have to rely heavily on volunteers. And the volunteers are often people from the community that just have an active interest in, in athletics or the particular event we cover. Uh, the other part are, are, the, are the students. They've been wonderful and uh, unfortunately because of some budget reductions we've had to scale back on TV production classes this last year but uh, prior to that they were our crew. Uh, they were the people and still are to this day. Uh, those people that come back run camera, run sound, run uh, do the editing and so on of all of these events and, and they put in just numerous hours and I can't begin to thank them enough. They've been wonderful to work with. They have a passion for what they do which is always fun and the quality of the work I is wonderful. So uh, it, all those people together make Channel 6 what it is. And uh, surprisingly enough, they did an outstanding job, as I think is evidenced by the library of material that the uh, station has at its, at its disposal. Uh, when you look at the sophisticated programming that we offer today on Channel 6, and the coverage we get and exposure as compared to that first year, I think we had to have the vision for that when we were first looking for that first director. And, you know, watching the different directors come and go uh, over the years, uh, Jeff Kaffs, Kasson, and uh, Sue Broadhagen, and, and now uh, you had uh, it, each, each person, starting with Alyssa Gagino, the first one, have brought different strengths, and they've taken those strengths, and they've kept them, and they've taken it to the next level by bringing their strengths and their expertise. And uh, it's a different studio and program than it was when we started. It's gotten better every year and I think we've had a series of wonderful directors who really poured their heart and soul into it to make it is what it is today. Over the years as cable television has evolved we've seen lots of uh, conglomeration of companies and companies purchasing other companies and trading properties of companies from time to time. But one thing that remains pretty consistent among the cable industry is the support of healthy local origination television. And the reason uh, for that is because it's important. It's an important 
uh, component of each of those communities. It's important to the cable companies. They've maintained the support all along of that because everyone values that. Everyone's proud to have that. And a, and a channel like CPHS 6, just covered with awards from its beginning and through the current time, is, is a pride to the community. It's a pride to the, com the cable company. And Comcast is enthusiastic to support an organization like that. I think what I remember most about Channel 6 is the students and working with the students. And to work with them from the beginning of the year and to see the improvement and the excitement as they learn how to frame a shot or how to edit a program and then to give them the opportunity to put their create creativity to use and produce programs. That's, that was probably the most fulfilling part of my job was working with the students. I mean, that's what it's all about. Um, I I think one thing that really struck me while I was working at Channel 6 is we um, had a death of one of our students and that made kind of a profound impact on me. I mean you hope you're having an impact on them and their education, what they're learning, but you also, when something so striking like a death happens in one of your kids, you realize what an impact they make on your life as well. In the, in the last 20 years I think Channel 6 has provided um, communication to, our, to the general public that is, is vital uh, in, in terms of our school system and, and the community. I, I say this to myself often, it was the best job and the best boss and the best people I worked with that I probably ever have. Uh, I consider Channel 6 just to be a vital key in the school district in terms of communication and promoting the positive things our students and staff do on a daily basis. But I know really the parents, what they like to see, they like to see their children. It gives people a chance to tape it and to have a permanent record. And what a wonderful thing for our community. Uh, most school districts are not fortunate enough to have something like Channel 6 and uh, I just think it's a great thing for all, for all of us. It was part of the facet of my uh, the job that uh, I found enjoyable. The people uh, at Channel 6, great to work with. It was fun uh, to be involved in it and to watch it grow and, and uh, to be able to be part of uh, the development in, in the uh, productions. The thing that means the most to me about Channel 6 is probably the students. Whether they're eight years old and I'm doing a career day or 18, it's the fact that I remember you you're from Channel 6 and, and you, now I love video or I'm, I'm at college, I'm doing this or an eight-year-old draws you a picture and writes you a story. It's just th those things that, that hit close, close to your heart. It certainly is a, is, is a magnificent tool, one which I suspect a lot of school districts wish they had. And it's one where, as I've said to the management of the, of the television station a number of times, it's one that I believe we have just begun to explore its potential. So there you have it, 20 years of history, all trapped within the confines of these walls. Two decades of memories, all embedded into videotape. And a lifetime of friendship, all derived here from the personnel at Channel 6. Indeed, it was a generous gift, one that was truly appreciated and wisely utilized. And uh, those decisions, I think, uh, that were made at the time to have that uh, opportunity for the channel uh, was uh, one of the best things that happened uh, to the district. And I think uh, the administrators who made that decision at the time did an outstanding job. They looked into the future, they saw the program work, and uh, they believed in it. And I know that the past has been great and I think the future can even be better. So that, that's about all I can remember except the people who work here had, have been very exceptional. They've been outstanding people.